before the historic FDA approval of barazmeterum, the mainstay for the management of patients with uh, Mazeld and MASH has been a lifestyle intervention to induce uh, 7 to 10% total body weight loss. Um, historically speaking, we provided our patients with different uh, dietary approaches and exercises. And uh, again, we provided them with clear goals for the uh, amount of weight loss they need to achieve in order to uh, get to what we call a MASH or NASH resolution and fibrosis regression. Uh, there was one randomized uh, trial that assigned people to a lifestyle intervention for one year. They did a biopsy at baseline, a biopsy after one year of the intervention. And they showed actually that if you achieve 10% uh, total body weight loss, uh, you can achieve uh, NASH or MASH resolution in upward of 80% of patients. And there was also fibrosis regression in 45%. Unfortunately, uh, the majority of patients are not able to achieve that 10% weight loss. And then even when they do, typically they are not able to maintain it. And that's why there was an urgent unmet need uh, to have FDA-approved medications uh, to support patients that uh, are not successful with the lifestyle intervention. Uh, so, uh, you know, anti-obesity medications have revolutionized how we actually treat uh, obesity, and they are very helpful in inducing uh, weight loss. Uh, so we have data with semaglutide, terzipatide, inducing um, 16, 17, up to 20, 22% uh, weight loss. And if you look at the percentage of patients that were able to achieve that 10% weight loss with semaglutide, it's around 70, 75%. Unfortunately, in the phase 2B trial with semaglutide uh, that also treated patients uh, for 72 weeks with doses similar to the obesity dose that we use, which is 2.4 milligrams weekly, uh, there was a high rate of NASH or MASH resolution up to 60% or so. Uh, however, there was no improvement in liver fibrosis. And based on that uh, phase 2B study, uh, we realized that there is still a very uh, high unmet need for patients, especially those with significant or advanced fibrosis. Having said that, uh, we have a phase uh, 3 trial with semaglutide that should read out hopefully by the end of this year, early next year, and we will find out more about the effects of uh, GLP-1s uh, on fibrosis. So uh, I think having a larger sample size in the context of a phase 3 clinical trial will give us a more definite answer if GLP-1s help with fibrosis or not. This uh, has been, as I said, a historic uh, FDA approval because this is the first medication approved specifically for the indication of uh, NASH and uh, F2 and F3 fibrosis. Uh, to have this available to our patients in clinic has been a game changer because, uh, um, as I mentioned also, it's been all about lifestyle intervention and the success rate has been low. We've had issues with uh, tolerability of GLP-1s and also insurance coverage, and many patients do not qualify for the obesity indication. Uh, so to have something that's indicated specifically to treat their liver disease uh, is a, a very um, a nice addition to what we do for these patients. Uh, the medicine has been well tolerated in the context of clinical trials with the two main side effects being uh, mild diarrhea and mild nausea that are manageable. Usually they last two to three weeks. Uh, it has very uh, few drug-drug interactions that are also very manageable. Uh, so I think patients are very excited to know that there is a treatment. Uh, many of our patients uh, have had type 2 diabetes for 10, 15 years. They've tried to lose weight for a long time. Uh, there is nothing special that we can offer them to make them lose weight and maintain it. So many of them are relieved to know that there is something else that can help them. Unfortunately, many of our patients also have family members that ended up developing NASH cirrhosis. Some of them developed liver cancer or needed the liver transplantation or unfortunately died from end-stage liver disease complications. So you can see that sigh of relief on their faces when you say, when things have changed, it's not going to be the same that uh, you know we uh, could have done for mom or dad or aunt. Now we have a medicine. And we do believe that, you know, by resolving NASH, by uh, leading to fibrosis regression, that we can potentially change the natural history of the disease. Of course, I want to highlight that the FDA approval was a conditional approval, uh, waiting for the data um, uh, with the biopsy that will be done after 54 months of treatment. 
uh, to look at how many patients actually progress to cirrhosis and the effects of resmeterone on preventing uh, progression to cirrhosis, but also preventing what we call uh, major adverse liver outcomes, such as development of ascites, variceal bleeding, and cephalopathy. Uh, so more to come on this, but I think, you know, to have this medicine available to us in clinic today is a big deal. Uh, we started prescribing literally the next day after FDA approval. Uh, we have a few patients that actually uh, got approved and received medicine. Um, and I'm eagerly waiting to see the feedback we're going to hear from them over the next few weeks on tolerability. And then also, I'm very excited to assess uh, response to treatment uh, based on non-invasive tests. And of course, we're not going to do multiple biopsies in the clinic. So erasmeterone is um, approved for, you know, patients with NASH and F2 after fibrosis. However, it does not have the indication for cirrhosis. Uh, there is an ongoing trial called the Maestro NASH outcomes that will help us answer that question and show benefit in a cirrhotic population, hopefully. Uh, so I would say the highest unmet need today is really patients with NASH cirrhosis. They have the highest risk of developing major adverse liver outcomes. And uh, we are not too sure about the safety also of medications like GLP-1 uh, because these patients um, have typically sarcopenia, muscle loss, and uh, by using too much weight, you can also make the sarcopenia worse. Uh, so we need to understand this. And there's ongoing studies now with semaglutide, other GLP-1s, uh, to help us, you know, tease out um, the amount of muscle loss and if that affects outcomes at all. Uh, so I think this would be the highest unmet need. Uh, another unmet need is uh, really just selecting patients without the need for biopsy, but also how do we monitor them using non-invasive tests. Uh, so this is more of a diagnostic need more than a therapeutic need. Um, we have several uh, NITs that we utilize in our clinics with fiber scan being the most commonly one utilized in a hepatology or gastroenterology clinic. Uh, there are similar technologies out there that can help us measure liver stiffness and the amount of liver fat. We have serologic tests. Uh, so in terms of, you know, identifying patients at baseline that qualify for resmeterone, I think we are there today. We do not need the biopsy, but we need more information on how to utilize these NITs to assess who's responding, who's not responding, and then determine if we need to do something else or we need to switch medications. Uh, so this is another unmet need we have. Uh, of course, targeting upstream and trying to prevent progression to NASH with F2, F3 fibrosis is also important, especially in young adults, because if you have F1 and you're 25 or 30, which is not unheard of, but actually uh, common in uh, referral centers, uh, then you are at risk of you know developing more progressive disease later in life. Uh, but I think we have to prioritize. This is an epidemic. We estimate that 30% of adults have mazled, and between 5 to up to 14% may have MASH. Uh, so I think, you know, targeting NASH with F2, F3 is the right decision at this point. But as we have more medications, as they become hopefully cheaper, uh, we would be able to target upstream and hopefully resolve the disease early on and achieve what we call a NASH cure.